What's up, guys? Josh here, and today we're going to be discussing the center and the margin, but more importantly, the 14 shadow work questions, the, the self-integration and self-improvement questions as well that use this framework to get another perspective from a higher vantage point. So first, what is the center and margin, and where do we get this idea from? It is a pattern of reality that is incredibly practical and helpful in life if you understand it and you can apply it. This pattern exists metaphysically within the individual psyche, within the family, within the society, at the level of the state, the level of the country, the world, and the cosmos, right? It scales all the way up and all the way down. To understand the center and the margin, some of the best tools are the symbols of the center and the margin, which we'll analyze in this video. But to give you a brief overview, the center is often the ideal place to be. It's not always, but it very often is, or the ideal state of being, right? So think of like the walled-in city, that well-ordered, structured, organized, walled-in garden or walled-in city, right? And outside of that, of course, you have chaos, but also potential. Inside, you have the order. It's very similar and sometimes interchangeable with up and down, right? Heaven and earth, uh, the top of the mountain and the bottom of the mountain or the pyramid, for example, with the golden tip. In the same way that temperate weather is ideal versus the extremes of too hot or too cold, um, temperate weather being the center, hot and cold being the margin or edge, you're best off in the center of bright and pitch black, where you can see comfortably, for example. And the center between order and chaos is generally the best place to aim for in, in your work or your habits or anything else in life. So you're not overwhelmed by too much chaos or bored and stifled and stagnant with too much order. And realistically, you only very rarely have a perfect balance of the two, right? To get the gold, so to speak, you have to venture out of the safe, walled-in city of order and out into the world of chaos and potential, right? That's where the treasure is, right? That's where the monsters are, the dragons that you have to slay to get the gold. But you don't want to stay there too long or else you become the monster. You'll become the dragon, right? You spend too much time with the dragons and you become a dragon, it's the way it works. Like Nietzsche says, he who fights with monsters should be careful lest he thereby becomes a monster. And if thou gaze long into the abyss, the abyss will also gaze into thee. It's a very practical understanding of reality when you understand it because you'll start measuring everything you do by this pattern with it. is the origin of a nation, whether it is the identity that you recognize your family having together, whether it is the idea of worshiping something together as a, as a religious community will worship something together. That is what binds you together. Uh, there is a unitive thing which makes us even recognize that we exist as a community or as even as a person. Right? You have a single experience of the world and that is what makes you know that you're one thing and not many things. And as you move out from that identity, you're able to realize that this identity is made out of multiple things. And that's a normal process, right? And so the United States is not one thing. The United States is one thing and many things at the same time. So there's a way in which we can explore the unity that binds us together. And we can also rejoice in the diversity which exists within that nation. And those things actually have to play with each other. There has to be a balance between those two. If we say something like diversity is our strength, which we've heard you know, my own prime minister say over and over again, now we have a problem. Because diversity without unity is decomposition. That's actually what decomposition is. If you have diversity without something binding you together, how do you even have the thing itself? the thing just falls apart, right? Anything, if you drop an apple to the ground, it starts to lose its unity, and then the outside things, the worms, the bugs, everything starts to break it down into an incoherent mush. And so 
When we notice that, when we notice that there's an obsession with that which is strange, which that, with that which doesn't fit, things that break the rules, things that are that mix identities together, we know that we are reaching the edge of something. And so one of the examples that we've seen is, for example, the obsession with the question of the border. Now, of course, conservatives usually fall on one side of that question. And they see that, you know, how can we have all these people coming in to our country illegally without knowing who they are, without knowing what, you know, what their story is? We have no sense of, of their identity. They are truly, in that sense, strangers. Now, a stranger is not a, is a category that has nothing to do with someone's race. Or it has, just has to do with the fact that we don't know who they are. It is, it is just the question of something which doesn't fit in our story, something that we don't know how to connect it to our story. So it's as true of a stranger that comes to the door of your house. Someone comes and knocks on the door. It, does he want something good from you? Does he, want, does he want to hurt you? You don't know yet. And so you approach tentatively and you try to figure out who the stranger is, what it is they want with you. And so the question on the border is the same. So on one side, people are obsessed with the idea of all this strangeness coming in from the outside and thinking, well, if all this strange comes in, at some point, we're going to cease to exist. But the other tendency can be a problem too, because when we're obsessed with the wall that separates the inside and the outside, that's also actually a sign that things aren't going well. Think of it, think of it again in terms of your family, for example. So imagine that you're so afraid of that which is outside that you want to close your family off completely. You want to create this impermeable wall around your, your identity, and so your children don't have access, don't learn how to deal with that which is strange, and will ultimately become something like allergic to that which is strange in a very bad way. And this is not just a not just a metaphor, it's true even in terms of hygiene, right? If your kids are don't have the chance to play outside and, and, and encounter strange things, encounter bugs, play in the play in the dirt or whatever, then they will become allergic to 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 the world around them. And they will become weaker for not having a healthy relationship with these bugs and this dirt. But if you see your kids eating the dirt, and if you see your kids eating the bugs, at some point you're gonna say, well, maybe here we've reached a limit. Like there's a limit of how it is that we engage with the strange. So let's dive into these questions. So to use this pattern, ask yourself, and keep in mind the first roughly half of these questions are uh, designed to be like a warm up to use uh, do your best to kind of get into like a flow state if you're writing this out and i would uh, uh, strongly urge you to to write this out this is it's it's best for journaling or shadow work journaling or whatever you want to call it um, if you can get into kind of a stream of consciousness sort of writing that's your best bet you're going to make a ton of mistakes it's going to be gibberish when you first start writing it out but you know just listen to the to the question and type whatever comes into your mind and just keep typing until it starts making sense. Okay, so what is the ideal center, that balance or that point of equilibrium of this goal of mine or this project or the projects that I have or the work that I'm doing or the habits that I'm trying to create? Am I deliberately pushing myself into the margin outside of my comfort zone where the hybrid monsters are, right? The dragons of chaos and thus the gold. Three, am I good enough? This is a rough one for a lot of us. <laughs> am I good enough and why? Why not? Both sides of this coin are very important and I strongly encourage you to, to, to find a balance on both sides. Like if you find yourself, uh, listing out all the ways you're not good enough, which is going to happen for a lot of us, if not most of us. And, and that's all you have. Make sure you balance the other side of, hey, this is why I am good enough, right? These are the skills I have. These are the talents. This, this is the foundation I've built over many, many years. Pay close attention to what bubbles up. And if that doesn't do anything, ask yourself, how can I improve myself? 
what are the areas I can be better in? Right. You can say this to uh, yourself, speak to your, you know, yourself as the archetype of the self. Uh, you can say this as a prayer. I know Jordan Peterson, this is one of the only versions of prayer that he, he talks about. Like he, he says this as a prayer and uh, and you listen and you write out what comes to you. And as you write out the ways you need to improve yourself, say, that is the old me. And this is the new me. And you could describe precisely what, uh, precisely what your ideal self looks like, uh, your, the future you, what you'll do, what each of these uh, habits look like, right? If you're talking about a, a habit that's tearing you down or, or bringing too much chaos into your life or whatever it is, well, you can flip that and say, that's the old me. The, the new me has these habits. And this, this is one of the best methods I've found for uh, self-correction and, and uh, striving for the most ideal version of myself. I, I love this method. So in the future, whenever you make a mistake, right, whenever you, you, you start slipping off of that uh, uh, straight and narrow or slipping down the mountain or being pulled down the mountain, say to yourself, okay, I messed up, but that's the old me. That is the old version of myself. That's not the new me. The new me does this, and this is what I will do the next time I'm presented with this situation. Okay, question number five. Am I aiming properly with my goals and my habits that shape my character and thus my destiny? Am I aiming at that invisible point in the very center of the center, the logos? Six. Am I delving into the depths of my shadow? The shadow being uh, the margin of your psyche uh, and the world of chaos and potential. Am I diving into, the, into those depths? Am I gazing into that abyss in search of the gold that I know is there? Seven, what strategy or tactic or, or method do I use to combat the self-defeating thoughts from the outside, from the margin? Um, and for this, I have a really cool method that I learned within the year, I think, or, or, or within the last couple of years, at least. It's and basically what you do is you, whenever you have a self-defeating thought, visualize a desktop and with the um, uh, wastebasket or the trash bin, whatever it's called, in one of the corners. Take that thought, visualize it as whatever you want, a piece of paper, or drag it over to the um, wastebasket or the trash bin, drop it in there, and then delete it. Empty the trash bin. I forget what it's called. And you can do that with, you know, using that visualization, or you can, you know, make it uh, one of those fire barrels or something and, and burn it, whatever it is. This is actually very effective if you, actually, if you make this a habit. Make it, make it a habit to, whenever you have a self-defeating thought come in from the outside, delete it burn it burn it away don't allow it to stay there don't allow it to take root because that's a seed and that seed can grow into something awful later down the road of course so this is one of my favorite methods i love this very 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 effective if you if you actually get into the habit of doing it all right eight what three adventures into the margins into the world of chaos and potential would I embark on if I knew I would succeed, right? And for these three adventures, do one for your physical health, one for your psychological health, and one for your spiritual health, right? Something like the body, soul, mind approach. If your life has too much chaos right now, flip that question to what are the three ways I can curb the chaos in my life? Uh, one being physical, two psychological, three spiritual. All right, number 10, using the framework of the center and the margin, what tips, life hacks, or strategies would I give a dear friend or son or daughter in my exact same position? 11, which habits cause too much chaos and need to be cut out of my life? Too, too much margin, too much abyss. Who? causes too much chaos who needs to be cut out of my life because they cause too much chaos and you can flip this question around as well and uh, replace chaos with order 
because you can, of course, have far too much uh, order in your life as well. Too much um, it becomes tyrannical in nature. All right, 12. What are the habits related to the center and the margin that I wish I had? Right, the habits I know would make me better uh, mentally. Consider me, you know, mentally, phys physically, emotionally, spiritually, etc. Thirteen. What is the name of the fear holding me back from creating the habits I know will transform my life? What is the name of the fear holding you back? And fourteen. How do I transmute that fear into a healthy fuel to drive me to the best version of myself? And the, and the way I like to see this is uh, there's not really much of a difference between fear and that excitement, that adrenaline you feel. Like uh, think about watching a scary movie or, or uh, riding a roller coaster or driving a really fast car or a motorcycle. Um, the thrill that you get, uh, just imagine that feeling what it feels like, and then imagine the feeling of fear in a, in a different sort of scenario that you just call fear. They're no different. They're the same feeling, the same emotion. So the best thing I think you can do, that, and this, this works incredibly well for me at least, is whenever I feel fear, I tell myself, this is uh, adrenaline is what I call it. This is my adrenaline. Right? This puts me in, in a peak state of attention, uh, awareness, um, ability. Right, I just have to channel this energy into what I'm doing uh, to, uh, to master the situation. And, um, and that works really well, just kind of reframing the fear. Instead of seeing it as a negative thing, realize, oh, this can be a really healthy and positive thing for me. Fear is good. Fear works, um, but of course there are an unhealthy versions of fear that you want to avoid.